Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. Today our topic is World War I, uh, and it's an important event not just in U.S. history, but also in world history. And here's our background. You can see it's like a stereotypical shot of uh, guys fighting in the trenches. You got your one guy with a machine gun. Uh, you got your other guy with your rifle about to charge across the trench into no man's land. And then you see no man's land in the background, like on fire uh, with an airplane in the back. And this is called the war to end all wars. Unfortunately, that wasn't true, but that's still what it was called. And this is by Mr. Miller from Zanesville High School. Hi, caramba! So, what are the background causes of World War I? Well, we're going to talk about four background causes here. Uh, the first one is nationalism. And nationalism, another way to say nationalism would be called patriotism. And this is extreme pride in or devotion to one's nation. So, when you see people, like in the United States case, when you see people with the flag and they're all decked out in red, white, and blue, like this guy on the tractor here, you can see him. This is definitely, you know, a sign of patriotism or nationalism. That's the first cause we can write down here. If you look on your notes, you'll probably see the four causes, A, B, C, and D. So what's B? Well, we can say imperialism. Now, I'm sure you've already talked about imperialism before you got to this note section. But I'll tell you what it is again. It's when one country tries to dominate another economically, militarily, or politically. And uh, oh, we'll go back for that. And this is a picture of William McKinley. And he was president during the Spanish-American War. And a lot of people were worried that he was an imperialist. He was like, going to become an American emperor. And you can see there in this cartoon, he's standing on a native uh, from the Philippines. He's got his foot on his back. And then behind him are two famous imperialists. Uh, one is Napoleon, and the other is Julius Caesar. Now you might ask, well, why wouldn't Hitler be back there? Well, Hitler was alive, but he wasn't popular yet, let's say. Third cause, militarism. A militarist nation desires to have the biggest military to frighten potential enemies and to use as a tool of diplomacy. Now, when I talk about militarism, I like to use... MMA fighters as an example. I'm going to show you this guy right here. This is Brock Lesnar. You might know him from WWE. He was a, you know, a famous wrestler in college, was national champion, and then went to WWE, and then went to the MMA. And the uh, idea here is if you saw him uh, in a supermarket and he, he walked up to you and said, told you to do something, you might just do it. Because, you know, he's big and strong, and he's also trained in martial arts. You don't want to mess with the guy, unless maybe you got a death wish or something like that. Um, in this case, when we're talking about militarism, it's the same idea with a country, okay? If a country has the biggest weapons, the most advanced weapons, and the biggest army and military, then uh, other countries that don't have that strength are going to be frightened of him. And they're not going to try to you know, fight with them. They're going to going to do what they say. And so the U.S. would use, the U.S., not just the U.S., but other countries would try to use their big militaries as a tool of diplomacy to kind of get what they wanted. And the fourth cause, this would be D on the list. These are alliances. If an enemy attacks your ally, your nation is obligated to protect your ally. And there were two major systems of alliances in Europe before World War I. And you can kind of see these here. Uh, the red is the Triple Entente. That was Russia, France, and Britain. And then the blue is Triple Alliance, Italy, Germany, and Austria-Hungary. Uh, now, Italy would leave that alliance, uh, but we'll talk more about that in the next slide. But you can kind of see those uh, systems of alliances there. Uh. Next one, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. Let's talk about these alliances for a second. Again, first off, the Triple Alliance was made up of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. When the war began, Italy left the alliance. 
and then two other countries would join them, uh, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire. And these would become the central powers. Now, a lot of people get confused and they think, ah, oh, the Triple Alliance, they became the allies. No, no, they didn't. The Triple Alliance became the central powers. So don't get confused with that. And here we see uh, three flags of the Triple Alliance, the main countries that were became the main powers in this alliance. It was Germany on the left, Austria, Hungary in the middle, and then this flag was the Ottoman Empire's flag. And Ottoman Empire today we would call it as basically Turkey. Now we talk about the Triple Entente. This is made up of France, Great Britain, and Russia. And it would see itself as the protector of smaller Slavic nations in the Balkan Peninsula. Now you might ask, what's Slavic mean? Well, Slavic is a type of ethnicity like German or Polish or something like that. This is Slavic. And Russians are also Slavic. So when they saw other Slavic people being hurt, they thought it was their duty to come to their rescue. And these countries and many others would become the allies. Okay, so the Triple Entente becomes the allies. And one way to remember the Triple Entente is to think about the flags of the major countries here. They're all red, white, and blue. And you got uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the Union Jack over here, that would be one of the countries. Then you got um, Russia here in the middle. Then you got France on the right-hand side. And then you got, of course, the United States, which would join the Allies. Not at first, but later on. Uh, next slide here, the trigger. What started this all into effect? Well, the trigger was an assassination. This was the killing of a guy named Archduke Francis Ferdinand. And he was the heir to the throne of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And this happened on June 28, 1914. He went to visit a city called Sarajevo uh, in Bosnia. And um, a man there uh, was a member of a group called the Black Hand. And this group called the Black Hand, they wanted to free Bosnian Serbs from Austria-Hungary. And they tried to blow up his car first as he drove through the town, and that was unsuccessful. But later on in the day, um, the uh, heir to the throne, Francis Ferdinand, was driving through the town in Sarajevo, and he stopped by a coffee shop. And inside the coffee shop was another member of the Black Hand named Gavillo Princep. And that's you can see on the right here. That's Gavillo Princep, uh, it's his prison photo. And then on the left, that's uh, Francis Ferdinand. And... Gavillo Princip said, well, I'm really lucky, and he walked outside of the coffee shop and shot uh, Francis Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie, killed them both uh, right there, right then and there. And that set everything into motion, um, because the Austrian-Hungarians Austria wanted to uh, basically get revenge for the death of their, their crown prince, their, their crown uh, archduke. And they were going to attack the Serbians. And then the S Russians, again, Serbians are Slavic people, so Russians want to protect them. So Russian came, Russians came into the war. And then all those alliances, which I showed you, they then went into effect. And they wanted to back up their buddies, and so that was the start of the war. Evil! Evil! Now, you might ask, what the U.S. was doing? How did they get involved? Well, I'm going to turn that over to somebody else right now, and that's going to be Mr. Jackson to help out. Okay, everyone, <clears throat> it's my turn. We're going to talk about U.S. involvement. So if you're looking on your notes right now, we should be down here on question one under U.S. involvement. What were the causes of the U.S. involvement? The U.S. stayed neutral for two and a half years, but eventually joined the Allies. There were several reasons for this. Because remember, in the last section that we talked about last unit, Woodrow Wilson ran on a platform to talk about he kept us out of war. And that was what Americans wanted to do. They wanted to stay out of the war. They didn't want anything to do it. They thought it was the Europeans' thing and not us. So they wanted to stay away from it. But some things happened that drug us into the war anyway. And we're going to look at those things right now. One, the Americans had a common language, law, system, and culture with Britain. Remember, that's who we fought and got our freedom from was Great Britain. So we're a lot alike with those people. So that's one reason. Another reason was Americans had a stronger economic ties with the Allies than the Central Powers. Economic means money and trade. So we traded and, and had money like them and, and things like that, did business with them 
more because they spoke our language, had some of the same common laws and things. So we were, we were tied to them closer than any other. You can see the flag right here. Look at our two flags. They're red, white, and blue. Stars and stripes. And you have the bars for the Great Britain flag. So it's a lot in common right there with that country right there. Third thing, German submarines, U-boats, as some of the films that I showed in my class to my students, we talk about the U-boats, and I'm sure Mr. Miller did the same thing in his, would sink several passenger liners with the U.S. citizens on board. One of these was the ship called the Lusitania, sunk in May 1915. 128 Americans died on this ship. This might sound familiar. Don't get this mixed up with the Maine. The Maine was a battleship that was in a harbor and started the, started the Spanish-American War. This is a passenger ship. This was like a cruise ship. You guys have all seen commercials on TV about go on a cruise. This is the kind of ship this was. This was a passenger cruise ship that was going from New York to Europe. And even though they put a lot of things out there saying, hey, don't 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 travel. It's not a good time. German U-boats are sinking all ships and all this stuff and any other. Americans felt they were safe because they weren't involved in the war. You can see there, there's a U-boat right there. You can see uh, in this picture, what they look like. And they're just basically a submarine. And, of course, when you sink a passenger liner and you kill Americans, that kind of upsets Americans a little bit. So that wasn't very smart on the Germans' part. Also, Germany violated the Suez Pledge. In 1916, the U.S. not to engage in unrestricted submarine warfare, sinking any ship but military or civilian. So they said this. They said they weren't going to do this. They made this pledge saying we weren't going to, you know, have unrestricted warfare with, with ships. And they broke it because they sunk the Lusitania. So another reason why Americans got upset and wanted to fight on Britain's side and against Germany is because Germany first sunk a cruise liner, which was our own ship. And then they promised, and then they promised after that not to do it anymore. And they continued to do it. So that's another reason. And the last and the uh, final thing I want to think, number six, Second, there's next, to next to last thing, is the Zimmerman telegram. In January 1917, which was sent from German foreign minister to German ambassador to Mexico, urged for Mexico to join Germany. This angered U.S. citizens. So what they were saying was, telegram went to Mexico saying, hey, if you join in and attack the United States, which Mexico is right next to the United States, Texas, that area there. If you invade the United States, we'll help you. And when we win the war, we'll make sure you get uh, a lot of land that you lost before back from them. You know, Americans weren't too happy with that, especially Texans. And there's a note right there. Or a telegram, I should say. It shouldn't say note. It was a telegram that was sent. Okay. Last thing, the Russian monarchy collapsed. Remember, Mr. Miller talked about earlier, the Russians joined in on Britain's side, okay? A new democracy was set up in Russia in March 1917. It would influence the U.S. because the Allies were now all democracies fighting against the oppression of empires. So by the Russians dropping out of the war, okay, that made America look at like, look, these are all democracies fighting for democracy, all right, so we need to go in and help them people out. So all these six things, and right here is a picture of the czar and his family. So all these six things right here, go back over. We had America had common language. America had a stronger economic ties to them. German submarines and U-boats would sink the Lusitania, then pledge not to do it anymore with the Suez Pledge. They broke that. Then the Zimmerman moat from the, uh, Germany to Mexico, to Mexicans, asking the Mexicans to attack the United States. And then the Russians dropping out. All six of these things is your question. Why were the U.S. entry? What were the things that got the U.S. involvement? So these six things right here anger the U.S. and made us get ready for war. Me fail English? That's impossible. So turning the page over your notes. Next question says, how did the United States prepare for war? The U.S. joins the war. The U.S. would officially join the war on April 2nd, 1917. But the country was not ready to fight. Remember, we're still a new country, okay? We were an imperialistic country, but we had kind of made our Navy kind of stronger, but we didn't have a lot of actual fighting-ready uh, men. So that was a problem. The U.S. would build up its army through the Selective Service Act. All you guys who are 18, women also, need to sign up for this. 
which required men to register with the government in order to be put into a draft. By the end of 1918, 24 million men had registered. Three million had been drafted and two million had been sent to fight. So basically you have to sign up and say that you will join the military. And they have a draft. They pull your name out of a ball. And then they call you until you have to report. All right. And then you become part of whatever part of the branch they get drafted into. This time right here, we had the one branch, basically two branches, the Army and the Navy. Air Force was a little shaky because we were just starting to invent planes, actually, during this time. And don't forget the Marines. Don't get them upset. <laughs> but still, both all these areas were small. So this right here had to influx of our own troops. And we had to train them. There's the famous poster. And we use this poster, actually, for this war in the future. I want you for the U.S. Army, nearest recruiting station. They still use this kind of poster today, actually. Uncle Sam. The U.S. had, an, had, a, had to counter the German U-boats. We would transport men and supplies using a convoy system in which transport supply ships were escorted by the guard of destroyers to protect against U-boats. So understand this. America, Germany couldn't really reach America, so we had, we manufactured good things. We had to get supplies, our men, and supplies for our allies to use over across the ocean to Europe. To do that, you had to cross that vast ocean, and Germany had U-boats out there. So you can see by this illustration that we would put our supply ships and our troops in the middle of this convoy and then stick destroyers and other boats on the outside to fend off any U-boat attacks. So that's what they mean by convoy system. And it's probably st it's still used today, actually, because it makes sense. Idly hey! Go home. Doodly do! So the question uh, number two, number one, how do we United States prepare for war is the draft. You should have that down. Then it says number two says how did the United States prepare for U-boat threats? We use the convoy system. So you should have those things down right there. All right. We have to back up. We can. If not, we're moving on. All right. Good job. So now we're moving on to the United States. The U.S. hits the ground and helps to turn the tide. First question says, why might it be strange that Woodrow Wilson would give command to the AEF to a General John Pershing? The American Expeditionary Force, or the AEF, would arrive in June of 1917. It was commanded by John Black Jack Pershing, who, if you don't remember from the Spanish-American War, he failed to capture Pancho Villa, but still he had a lot of experience. Yes, after the Spanish-American War. But he got a lot of experience from doing that. And there it is, John Black Jack Pershing right there. Good picture of him, actually, in color even. That's pretty nice. The U.S. troops were nicknamed Doughboys and they brought enthusiasm to the war. Remember, this war had been going on for three years now before we entered. So the people who were fighting this war were kind of tired. Americans, we were invigorated. We were happy. We were like, hey, this is our first time to get out there and strut our stuff. And the term doughboys comes from a lot of things. One, I think, is enthusiasm. But the other thing was they took dough, and they used to shine their buttons and their boots and their uniforms with that. And not these doughboys, okay? Not the Pillsbury doughboys. If you look like that right there, I don't think the army would be very happy with you. Especially if I could punch you with my finger and make you hoo 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 and laugh. That wouldn't be good at all, guys. That's not good. You want to look like these guys right here, hardened soldiers, ready for, ready for everything, all right? So those are the reasons why they call it doughboys. I think it's enthusiasm because the Americans were excited to go over there because it's our first time really defending our country and, and being with somebody since our own... Uh, imperialism's thoughts. The turning point of the war was when the 2nd Battalion of the, of the Marne, 2nd Battle of the Marne, July and August 1918, where the Allied forces began to advance on Germany. Within a few months, all of the Central Powers had surrendered. An armistice was signed on 11-11-918, which ended the fighting. So looking at our questions up here, why might it be strange that Woodrow Wilson would give command to the AEF to General John Pershing? Why was it strange for? He was really the only real leader we had in the army. I had any experience at all. Not really strange. The only thing was strange was, right, he failed to capture Pancho Villa, but when you're looking for experience, what do you got? What was the nickname of U.S. troops coming over to fight in the war? The Doughboys. I told you why that was. What was the turning point of the war? Right there. 
It was the second Battle of the Marne, July and August 1918. When did the fighting end and what holiday would they become? So when did the fighting end? You look right there on the screen. It says 11, 11, 1918. So November 11, 1918, when the fighting ended. And what holiday would this day become? At the time, it was called Armistice Day. As you can see there, Armistice Day, November 11th. Now, because that wasn't the last war that America fought, all right, we had other wars, as you will talk about World War II, and then we went into the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and now we've even had wars since then in the Middle East. They changed the name from Armistice Day to Veterans Day. We all get that day off in in November in school. And it's a day just to remember our veterans, those who have fallen, those who are fighting still for us, and those who are in uniform today. It's just a day to remember those who have served, who are serving, and who have died to, to let you guys sit in these classrooms and be able to take have school and to come to school every day and get an education and be free. So just remember that. It's an important date. I'm going to turn it back over to the real man himself, Mr. Miller. All right. Back here. Go away, put your weapon. Go away, put your weapon. Go away, put your weapon. I mean you no harm. Sorry with the sounds there. I want to talk about one thing before we go on. This picture of the flowers here. These are poppies. And poppies are important uh, to World War I because they became the symbol uh, of the veteran in Armistice Day. You see, uh, after, during the war, a lot of soldiers died, and many of them could not be, their bodies could not be shipped back to the United States or to their home country. So the Allies buried them in, in fields. One particularly famous field was Flanders Fields. And in Flanders Fields, there were a lot of poppy seeds that were lying dormant. Now, dormant is a scientific term meaning, like, you know, the flowers, they, they don't, they're, not, they're not dead, but they're not alive. They're just kind of sitting there. So, you know, they turned over the ground, they dug all these holes, they buried the soldiers. And, and then when they buried the soldiers, these flowers, they became, they activated, so to speak. They became alive, they stopped being dormant and started to grow. So wherever the soldiers were buried, the flowers grew. And, and that became the symbol for Armistice Day and later Veterans Day. You can still see sometimes uh, veterans, they sell uh, uh, paper poppy flowers to... Uh, to make some money to raise funds and stuff like that, and they do that because that's a symbol of the, the veterans. Go away, put your weapon. I mean you no harm. But the war is over now, so what, what are we going to do? Uh, how are we going to create the peace? Because just because the fighting ended doesn't mean that everybody's all happy and, and ready to shake hands and be friends again. So Woodrow Wilson presented his 14 points. Now remember, Wilson is our president, and this was his plan for peace. The first... Five points dealt with things like ending of secret treaties and alliances. He wanted freedom of the, of the seas and reduction of arms. The next eight points, so if you're counting that 13, they dealt with the self-determination of nations. What does that mean? And I see that question there in this slide. It says, what does it mean by the self-determination of nations? That means allowing countries and peoples to rule themselves. That's all of that means. Uh, Self-determination of nations means that countries and people are allowed to rule themselves. They're not told what to do by some monarch or king thousands of miles away. The last point uh, of Wilson's 14 points was for the creation of the League of Nations. And that's the second question on your handout. What was the purpose of Wilson's last of his 14 points? To create the League of Nations. What was the League of Nations? It's simply an international peacekeeping organization where people would solve problems without fighting. And there's a symbol of the League of Nations there. When Wilson went to France in June of 1919 to participate in a post-war peace conference, he would propose his 14 points to other leaders. And this conference was known as the Peace Conference at Versailles. Not Versailles. <laughs> Some people in Ohio, well, in the town in Ohio is uh, spelled the same way, but in Ohio we say Versailles, but for this we're saying Versailles because it's French. Who were the big four uh, leaders at this conference at Versailles? Well, it was Woodrow Wilson of the United States, David Lloyd George of Great Britain, George Clemenceau of France, 
and Vittorio Orlando of Italy, and they dominated the conference at Versailles. They were known as the Big Four. So that's the third question for this slide. Who were the Big Four? Wilson of the U.S., George of Great Britain, George Clemenceau of France, Vittorio Orlando of Italy. And you can see their pictures here. Starting off on the left, that's Vittorio Orlando. Then the guy with the walrus mustache, that's uh, Clemenceau of France. Uh, next guy is David Lloyd George of Britain. And then our guy, Woodrow Wilson of the United States. thing about this is the defeated nations, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire, they weren't represented at Versailles, so they really didn't get a say in what uh, went down there, which uh, in retrospect, like looking back, you know, might have saved some problems if they had had a representative there. Wilson compromised on most of his 14 points, and the reason he did that was to establish the League of Nations. And that's, that's the fourth question, the last question on this slide. Why did Wilson compromise on his most of his 14 points? Because he wanted the last one to get through. He wanted the League of Nations to be created because he thought that would solve any problems that would come in the future. Yes, a Jedi strength flows from the Force, but beware of the dark side. You gotta be patient with my crazy sounds, sorry. So, what did the Treaty of Versailles do? There were a lot of treaties signed at this peace conference at Versailles, but the most important one, one we're going to focus on is the Treaty of Versailles. And what did this Treaty of Versailles do? Okay, two things I want you to write down. I'm going to give you a list of things that it did, but there are two things I want you to write down um, for this answer. The first question on your notes here. It says, it dealt with Germany, and it has established a League of Nations. So how can we write that? We can just say it punished Germany and it created the League of Nations. So for the first question for this side, you just say, what did the Treaty of Versailles do? It punished Germany, and it created the League of Nations. But I want to give you a little more specific stuff here. The provisions include stuff like this. It created nine new nations in Europe, and you can see the map here, Europe before World War I in 1914, and Europe after World War I in 1919. There's a lot fewer countries in 1914 than there is in 1919 there. And the whole purpose was to try to give different countries a say, uh, different peoples a say in how they were governed. I want to stop here for a second and just show a little video to kind of emphasize this point here, all about the uh, Treaty of Versailles. I'm going to try to. I'm going to end the show for a second. We'll come back to it. Don't worry. I know you're all waiting with bated breath. Um, here we go. Oh, okay, this is a little video all about the Treaty of Versailles. And this is from Britannica.com. But when it was all over, the statesmen went to discuss the peace treaty at Versailles, armed only with 19th century prejudices. idealism of President Woodrow Wilson would soon be shattered by the harsh practicalities of his European partners. They were determined that never again would the Germans have the opportunity of ravaging France. The treaty dismembered Germany and its allies, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. These large and powerful states were to be broken up so that the various ethnic groups they contained would have their own separate countries. Unfortunately, however, this checkerboard of small independent nations would prove to be too weak to defend itself against an embittered and vengeance-seeking Germany. Instead of healing old wounds, the Treaty of Versailles only succeeded in creating a new discontent. More drastic solutions would soon replace the fumbling of the diplomats. Okay, so that was our video from Britannica.com. Now let's go back to the uh, slideshow here. Start from current. Yes, a Jedi strength flows from the Force, but beware of the dark side. Yeah, beware of the dark side. Okay. Now, uh, again, that video kind of emphasizes how the big countries were broken up into little ones. 
some other things the Treaty of Versailles did. Okay, it established Germany as the only country to blame for World War One. Now, looking back, we know that that is not exactly true. Germany wasn't the only country to blame. If any country was to blame, it was Austria-Hungary and maybe the Serbians, but Germany was just coming in to help its buddies out. But Germany was the only country that had money to pay, basically, for the war and for what had been done, so Germany got the blame. That's the next question. It says, what was the war guilt clause of the Treaty of Versailles? The war guilt clause put all the blame for the war on Germany, and that's what you need to remember about the war guilt clause. Other things... Germany was banned from an air, having an air force. They were limited to a 100,000-man army, and they weren't allowed to have U-boats. Key point there. Number four, Germany would also have to pay $33 billion, and that's a lot of money today, but it's even more back in 1919, $33 billion in reparations to the Allies in return for causing World War I. Now, the next question says, what are reparations? That's not hard to define. Reparations are simply, for, for our case, it's payment for damages done. That's what reparations are, payments for damages done. And the last part here, part of Western Germany, the Rhineland, would be occupied by the Allies, and it would act as a buffer zone between Germany and France because the French were really afraid of Germany coming in, and they needed a buffer zone between you know, them and the Germans to protect them. And so the fourth question says, what, was, what purpose did the Rhineland serve in the Treaty of Versailles? Simple. The Rhineland would act as the buffer zone between Germany and France. And here on this map we can see where the Rhineland is. It's all around the Rhine River. It's in yellow with the cross lines across it. And it acts as protection for the French from the Germans. No. Why not? Do or do not. There is no try. Now here's one of the big ideas, the big questions we need to understand about World War I and how it led to World War II. And in my class, I know this is one of their learning targets. Um, how did World War I lead to World War II? And that's what we're going to address here. So first question, this is a lot of writing here, so you just kind of got to listen. I'll, I won't, I'll try not to speed through it too much. Many U.S. politicians did not approve the Treaty of Versailles. See, before it can go into effect for the United States, it doesn't matter if the president has said it's a good thing. The U.S. Senate needs to approve of that treaty, okay? And so if the U.S. Senate is in agreement with the president, uh, they got issues. And this is for any treaty, not just a Treaty of Versailles. If the president today, if Barack Obama signs a treaty with another country, the Senate has to approve it. And so the U.S., Many in the U.S. didn't want to be part of the League of Nations, and that's what the Treaty of Versailles did, made us a member of the League of Nations. They were afraid that the U.S. would be forced to go to war to defend other nations in the League, and they didn't want that. They said, why should we fight for a country that's thousands of miles away? That is, that's stupid. We're not going to do that. And so that's the first question there. Why did U.S. politicians fear the Treaty of Versailles? They didn't want the U.S. to go to war to defend other nations in the league. They thought that was just ridiculous. And the main opponent of this treaty was a guy named Henry Cabot Lodge. And here's his picture there. I love the facial hair of these guys. It takes a long time to grow this stuff. And I don't have the patience for mine, but these guys obviously did have patience. Henry Cabot Lodge. And at first, uh, the Republicans and the conservatives in the Senate, they said, let's try to work with Woodrow Wilson. Maybe we can get this to work out. But Wilson, he was going to be stubborn. He wasn't having any of this. Wilson refused to compromise. So that's the second question here. What was Wilson's response to trying to amend the Treaty of Versailles? He said, no, go pound salt. I'm not going to do it. Um, I just spent months in Europe with uh, the big four there, the big, other big three, working on this treaty, and I'm not changing it. It's the way it is, and it's staying that way. And so the Senate said, fine, you want to be like that? We're going to reject the treaty, and the U.S. did not join the League of Nations. The League was created, but it lacked a great deal of power to enforce its decisions because the U.S. didn't join. And there's consequences for this. Uh, this lack of cooperation was, was a bad thing, not just uh, for like the U.S. eventually, but for the whole world. First, this is one of the reasons for the start of World War II. The League of Nations was too weak to stop the fighting 
because the U.S. didn't join. So again, the question, how did World War I lead to World War II? League of Nations wasn't strong enough to stop the fighting because one of the strongest nations in the world wasn't part of it. And then the U.S. begins a policy of isolationism. This is a key term. You're going to have to remember this for tests and for big tests uh, later on. Isolationism is a withdrawal from wars and world affairs. The U.S. started to do this after World War I. They saw all the death and destruction of World War I, and they said, nah, not for us. We're not going to be involved in this. And the U.S. would then sign several treaties, including the 1928 Kellogg-Briand Pact, to prohibit war as an instrument of national policy. The U.S. went as far as to say, hey, we're not even going to engage in war anymore. We're not even going to think about it. We're going to promise not to get involved. And so, number three, what is isolationism? It's a withdrawal from world affairs and war. And what country began to practice it after World War I? That was us, the United States. Third, okay, uh, consequence here. Germany was weakened after the war, and they were in pretty bad shape. They had to pay reparations. Many of their men had died, and the League of Nations couldn't really help Germany or stop it if it were to rearm itself. And so the Germans are pretty down on themselves. They're depressed. And this gives a guy named Adolf Hitler, it gives him a chance to rise to power. Hitler comes in and says, hey, Germany's in a bad shape right now, but I can make it great again. All you need to do is listen to what I say. And not all Germans agree with him, but enough did. Um, they were looking to anyone who could help them return to prosperity. And uh, there's a picture of Woodrow Wilson near the end of his term as presidency, and he was just really, after he failed to get the Treaty of Versailles passed, he actually had a stroke and wasn't very active the last year or so of his presidency, and that's a picture of his wife and him uh, on the inauguration of Warren G. Harding, who would take his place. But again, the last question here, uh, without a strong League of Nations to help it or stop it, Germany turned toward what dictator to bring it out of poverty? That was Adolf Hitler. Strong am I with the force. The seeds of World War II were planted in World War I, but that conflict was still a couple decades away. You got a few more things to study before you get to World War II. Well, that concludes our World War I notes. I want to thank Mr. Jackson for participating with me. And uh, if you want to find any other lectures about U.S. history, you're just going to go uh, subscribe to my channel by hitting the button down below and uh, keep uh, up to date on what I'm putting out there for you. Hope you guys have a good day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.